Oh, good morning to you all. And is the sound okay? Yep, that's good. I'm just liking to check. Okay, it's good to see you. And uh, thank you for your prayers through this uh, last wee week, which has been an exciting week. Uh, pretty well a horizontal week, but that's fine. Uh, now fully recovered, which is good. One of two things that are happening this week, it's the usual pattern. So Monday night, remember the prayer time between eight and nine. And can I at this point say thank you to Lee Ming and to Andrea for organizing the prayer event yesterday. I know it wasn't particularly well attended, which is disappointing. I know some people received the information online as I did myself, and that was helpful and really appreciated having that and to be part in that way. But thank you to both of them for all the work they put in to prepare uh, for yesterday. And, and I trust that those who engaged themselves in the prayer felt touched by God, led by God, inspired by God, and maybe he even spoke. And if he did speak to you, then if it's relevant to the congregation, please pass that back. That's really important. On Tuesday this week, there's the Open Door Support Meeting at half past seven across in Trinity in the Buchanan Hall for those who want to be part of it. We've got worship here again on Wednesday morning, which is now just part of the pattern of worship in the community, which is great. And I feel in some ways I shouldn't need to remind you, but at the same time, it's good to be reminded that it's taking place. The same applies to Renew Wellbeing. If you haven't been along, come just to see what it's like and to get the sense of it, because that way it's much easier to say to somebody else who you think might enjoy going, well, I've been and this is what it's like. So just drop in, even if you want to find out what it's like. And then on Saturday morning this week, we have the prayer breakfast between nine and 10. And Leslie wants to come and share a wee word. Um, so Stuart, if we can have the other mic on, that would be great, thanks. Didn't think it was right for Wilma to announce her own retirement celebration. So as you all know, next Saturday afternoon, we're having, well, hopefully it's a garden party. We're praying for sunshine. And if not, well, we'll just make the best of it in here. But uh, two till four next Saturday. Um, if you can be here at three, that's great. But anytime between two and four, some folk might only drop in. Some folk might want to stay the whole time, whatever you can manage. Um, Wilma's very keen that it's very informal. It's very low key. Everyone's very relaxed and just enjoys themselves. So that's the vibe for next Saturday. Um, some folk have already volunteered to help in practical ways. Perhaps we could just have a quick chat, maybe through in the small hall, if that's appropriate, is it? Just after the service. Those, And if you haven't yet volunteered but feel there's something you could do, please come as well, just to sort things out. Um, hard to believe next weekend is Wilma's last weekend as our minister. I don't think well, we find that quite hard. To, it is quite unreal, really. But anyway, it is happening. So um, <laughs> next Saturday uh, for that. And of course, Sunday will be um, Wilma's final Sunday with us in that capacity, hopefully not ever. Um, and various family and I presume others will be coming to join. So a busy Sunday, I think next Sunday. So it would be lovely to all be here again to, to just... Um, Give her a good send off, but uh, she's not going to be a stranger either. But anyway, so please, small hall after the service if you're able to help. Thank you. Thank you. It feels really weird uh, thinking there's only this Sunday and next to go, but I'm not thinking about it too much because if I do, then I'm going to bubble. Um, and as somebody said to me, that's okay, we're expecting you to bubble, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I better warn you, I think Lydia's planning to come next Sunday, all right? So we might have a, a toddler toddling, um, which will be fine. There's one other notice, and it's to do with the Dunblane event, which you probably noticed on, on the loop at the beginning. It's not going on till 4.30, you'll be glad to know. We're planning to stop at quarter to four, okay? And it's not starting till half past 10 in the morning, although coffee will be available from quarter to, to 10. Uh, but our congregation, um, and I include myself because I will be there, all right, and I'm willing to help with the coffee. Um, our congregation is, um, has been asked if we would deal with coffee through the day. So we need some volunteers. Really, all you need to be able to do is to fill a cup with water and hand it to people and wipe tables. It's not hugely complex, okay? Um, and you're not doing it through the whole day. 
You're doing it. There's a first thing in the morning, then over lunchtime, and then in the afternoon. So it's three shots of handing people coffee. But it would be great if there were enough people to do it that not the same people had to do every shift, was my thought. So if you think you could be involved in that, and this is all ages, uh, both genders, you know, everybody's welcome, um, then would you please speak to Leslie and you can put my name on the list, all right? I will help as best I can, okay? If you'll have me. Um, <laughs> so I'll come, in, I'll come as an infiltrator and that will be fine. So I think those are all the notices and uh, let's now focus on worshiping God, which is really what we're here to do this morning. We're thinking this morning a, a bit about holiness and what holiness means. Because it's one of the, one of the things that the, Paul's letter to Timothy is, is trying to reinforce God's people are meant to be different to the world. We are meant to be a holy people. And sometimes there are challenges in that. And, and we're going to be looking at some of those challenges this morning. We're not made holy in our own right. It's God who makes us holy. But we should have that desire to let God work in us and shape us to make us his holy people. In Psalm 9, we read these words that remind us of the constancy of God, but also that God is a God who expects certain standards. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Let's praise God together, thinking about his holiness as we sing together, holy, holy, holy.
Let's join together in prayer. Almighty God, our refuge, our strength, the one who gives peace in the storm and comfort through times of trouble, we praise and thank you. God of justice, whose ways are right, who can always be trusted, who sees the ways of this world and one day will judge according to your standards. We praise and thank you. As we gather together to worship, to praise your holy name, we ask that we would draw closer to you. We pray that we would learn from you. We would learn from your word. We pray that we would listen for your voice. Be reminded of your truths and your ways. And even be challenged by you. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of worship. We thank you that worship is our gift to you, but it is also your gift to us. You enable us to worship through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. The way has been made open for us. We praise and thank you. Loving God, forgive our hard hearts. Forgive our stubbornness, our self-reliance, our lack of love, our struggles to forgive, and our struggles to accept forgiveness. As we worship, we pray that you would soften our hearts that you would change us to make us more like Jesus. Forgive our sin. Help us to turn from it. And help us to honour you in our living and our thinking. Help us to keep before us the image of Jesus. Help us to model ourselves on him. Help us to allow your Holy Spirit to have free reign in us. Changing us. Reminding us of Jesus' teaching. Helping us to glimpse Jesus in all his glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bring you our praise and our thanks through Jesus. Amen. I've said that we're thinking about holiness as we explore uh, Paul's letters to Timothy, what it is to be a holy people. I thought it might be useful to explore that word holiness and, and what it means there might be aspects of it you haven't thought of before. The Bible Project are going to help us think about holiness. You've probably heard the word. You've probably heard the word holy before, or at least sing it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So. God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. 
So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness, because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the most holy place. It's the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death, like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal, and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development, this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now, but 
Where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. And this time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there, flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. Lots to think about there. But I love that, looking at um, the burning coal and Jesus being like the burning coal, and, and we can be made holy. And, and that's God's purpose for us, that as his holy people, we can go out into the world and share Jesus, that other people can be made holy, can be made pure. And that's what Paul grasped. And that's what he wanted Timothy to know. And that's what he wanted shared with the church in Ephesus. Let's reflect on worship and, and our attitude to worship in a song that we, I think, know we maybe haven't sung it for quite a while. It's called Heart of Worship. Craig's going to read for us in a moment uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 8. This comes within the section that in the NIV is entitled Instructions on Worship. So we're thinking about what happens in an act of corporate worship when God's people gather together to, to praise his name. So Craig, 1 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 8. Thank you. Therefore, 
I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. I know, all you can do is raise your eyebrows. And that's the challenge, isn't it? That there are passages in Scripture that we struggle with, that we wrestle with, that we, we have to try to tease out and understand. And I hope I'm going to help you do that this morning. I've certainly been wrestling with this. Um, can I say I've been wrestling with this for about 40 years? Okay. Uh, yeah, probably it's about that, that length of time. Uh, some of the passages in Scripture, and whether or not they are for this time, for all time, for Paul's time, whether they're of God, whether they're of Paul, all these things. And it's right that we don't just ignore passages that we look at them, we examine them. Sometimes we have to say, I don't understand that for now, and we have to park it. Sometimes we have to say, this is really challenging, because it's challenging me personally, then we have to examine it. And sometimes we have times when the passage that we're reading is even causing dispute in the church, and the church has to tease it out, maybe for years. Now, last week, when John was preaching, he was reminding us about the importance of prayer because that was the passage that uh, he was given to preach on. Within worship, God's people were to pray. And that's not contentious, is it? Right? Prayer, Jesus taught, was also something that we do privately. We remember that he told us to go into our room and to shut the door which assumes you have a room and assumes you have a door. But really he's saying just find a quiet place where you can be on your own to pray. So there are different ways of praying. Our corporate prayer where we're all together and our personal prayer. And we know that for Jesus and the disciples, Jesus went away on his own to pray. Jesus prayed with his disciples. And we also know that they went into the synagogue to pray and to the temple to pray, to take part in these bigger acts of worship. So prayer is important. Why? Well, because prayer changes us. Yes, prayer is a way of connecting with God, but if prayer is really this two-way encounter that we believe it to be, as we talk to God, God will speak to us, God will change us, God will address things in our lives that he feels we should be paying attention to. He'll give us insight and wisdom into the world round about that will help us to go out there and to share Jesus in the world. Our, our very understanding of God can change as we pray. And so can our attitudes to God, but also to other people. Now, the number of people who have been angry with somebody, frustrated with somebody, and they've brought it to God in prayer, and God has given them an insight into the other person that has enabled them to let go of their anger and their frustration and to actually look at the other person more through God's eyes. So prayer is far much more than simply uttering a few words to God and moving on. So that's the general talk about prayer. Now within this act of corporate worship, 
Paul wrote to Timothy, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Take a look at your hands just now. You probably know them quite well. They've been with you a long time, some longer than others, but we'll not go there. Are your hands holy? Well, they have the capacity for doing good, don't they? They have the capacity for doing what God wants. They have the capacity to do what's right and proper in God's eyes. But they also have another capacity, don't they? They can be used for other purposes that are not good and are not honoring to God. That's true for our whole bodies. So how can any man or any person lift up holy hands in prayer? Only if Jesus makes them holy. Only if we know his forgiveness and his cleansing. It's Jesus who makes our hands holy. Now within Jewish worship, which Paul knew well, there were times in prayer when the men would lift their hands, not high above their heads, but they would lift their hands, palms uppermost, as a sign to God, a sign of being open to God, a sign of worship. But of course, anybody can do that. It's not difficult, is it? You just pop your hands up. That doesn't make your hands holy, nor does it mean that that is an attitude of worship. Because worship begins in the heart. And what God is saying to those who are leading worship and leading prayer and praying in, well, it would be in the synagogue, but it would also be within church. I couldn't care less about the hands raised. What matters is the attitude of the heart. And if the heart is right, then those hands raised are raised in worship. But if the heart is not right, those hands are just an empty sign. They are a ritual. It's putting on a show. And of course, God knows because God knows our hearts. I was reminded of that parable that Jesus taught, and you'll know it well. It's from Luke 18. This is what it says. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I have. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, in pictures of this parable, and there are many of them, the Pharisee is usually depicted with his eyes looking heavenwards and his hands up to God. But who is he praising? Himself. That's not worship. The true worship came from the tax collector who knew how wrong he was and who asked God for mercy. In Psalm 24, we read these words. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Which really means who can get toward God's presence? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, 
who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear deceitfully. It's about the heart. And anyone who is engaged in leading prayer in worship, in an act of worship, isn't there to demonstrate how great they are, but is there to focus attention on God. And that means it can be the humblest, most simple prayer. And that matters to God. He would rather have that than the show. So Paul wrote about men lifting up their holy hands in prayer, and, and we get that they can only be made holy through Jesus, and it's not about to show, and all the focus is to be on God. Did you notice that Paul also, within this context of prayer, wrote about women? There's no change of paragraph. We go, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without our anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly. Now, this all sits within the words about prayer. So Paul seems to be saying to the women, when you're praying, there are things I expect of you too. Did Paul let women pray? Well, yes, he did. Did Paul pray with women? Yes, he did. When Paul went to Philippi, this is in Acts 16, this is what we read. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. They knew there was a group of followers of Jesus who met to pray. And we sat down and began to speak to the women there. No mention of men. They might be there too. But Paul was speaking with the women. And it was there in that place that Paul met Lydia and her friends. And it was Lydia who invited Paul and his friends to use her home, which became a house church. So Paul was quite comfortable with the idea that women prayed. And in this paragraph, he is saying, men, it's about the attitude of your heart. Women, the same applies to you. I also want, sometimes that in some translations is translated likewise. Men, here's for you. Likewise, women, this is for you. I want you to dress modestly with decency and propriety. So you're not to have too much of you on show. That might look very nice in other contexts, but that's not modest in the context of worship. So think about what you wear. But don't think about what you wear so that you look as good as you possibly can. I'm not looking for the elaborate hairstyles. Sorry, I had mine cut. But yeah, I'm not looking for elaborate hairstyles. I'm not looking for fancy jewelry. That's not what's important. I'm not looking for expensive clothes. That's what he says. What matters more in your life is that you're living well for God, that you are carrying out good deeds, and that when you come to prayer, your heart's right with God too. It's not about how you look. It's about what's going on inside you. And I was reminded of, of another teaching of Jesus. It wasn't to women. It was when he was speaking um, to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And he said to them, you hypocrites. It's not the way to endear yourself to people, is it? But he spoke the truth. He said, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Paul's saying to the women, 
it's not about what you look on the what you look like on the outside that matters. But is your heart right with God? Are you allowing him to make you a holy woman? In worship, we're looking for holy men and holy women who are praying to God. The focus isn't on you. The focus is on God. The focus isn't on how well you speak or how great you look. The focus is on Jesus in you. Come to worship. Even be involved in leading prayer in worship. Because God calls you. Because you want to honor him. Not because you want to be seen. It's all about Jesus. It's all about God. And it is not about the preacher or the reader or the person leading prayer. They get in the way, then it's not worship. And that's a challenge to all of us involved in leading worship anytime. Let's pause for a moment and then we'll get back to that women and men. Let's praise God as we sing together. You are a moment. So let's remind ourselves of Paul's words. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, 
What challenges have you heard in those verses? Is the key challenge for you that Paul says that women shouldn't teach men or he doesn't allow women to teach men? And, and I say that because he doesn't say that God doesn't let women teach. Right? He says, this is my position. I don't let women teach and have authority over a man. Is that what challenged you? Or were you challenged by that verse that women will be saved through childbearing? Because that isn't what Jesus said. Jesus said salvation came through believing in him, not through giving birth. Now, these five verses have caused scholarly argument for generations. So I'm not going to resolve it, okay? But I'm going to try to tease out some of the ideas that people have had. One of the key things is, was Paul writing for his time? Was he writing just for the church in Ephesus at this point? Or was he writing for all time? And we can't say with certainty, all right? He's definitely writing to Timothy to the church in Ephesus for this time and for their situation. But we know that Paul taught elsewhere that he didn't allow women to speak in church. But never did he say, God doesn't allow it. It was always personal. I don't allow. And there may well be good reasons for that. There's this awful challenge or I would say an awful statement, women will be saved through childbearing. I mean, I find that a really difficult thing to read. I find that more difficult to read than women shouldn't have authority over a man. Because I think of all the women I know and you know who've never had the opportunity to bear a child. Does that mean they can't be saved? Is that what he's saying? He cannot mean that, although that's what it appears to say. And then what about the responsibility that's placed on Eve for sin? Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. It's all her fault. Sin is the fault of woman. Really? If Eve hadn't been tempted, all would be well. Really? Now, many rabbis in Paul's time condemned Eve because they said she had brought sin into the world. So they really did heap all the responsibility on Eve. And, and it might seem that Paul is, is joining with them in what he wrote to Timothy, but we have to look elsewhere in scripture. And in Romans 5, this is what Paul wrote. And you're probably more familiar with this. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And that's the first Adam. And of course, he's going on to explain that Jesus is the second Adam who redeemed the world. So what Paul wrote to Timothy here, that sin is the responsibility of women, is challenged by what he wrote in Romans, where he says it's the responsibility of man. So what he's actually saying? Well, I think he's saying what we all know. Men and women both sin. And okay, Eve gave in first, and she took the fruit, and she tasted it, and then she offered it to Adam. But he didn't refuse it, did he? He took it too. And I doubt there was a huge amount of time between one eating and the other. So they are both guilty of sin. 
Men and women are equally guilty. And when we go back to Genesis, we discover that man and woman, Adam and Eve, both having sinned, God banished them from the Garden of Eden. And he said the man had to work the land. That was his punishment. So a bit of hard graft. That's what it's expected. The woman's punishment was pain in childbirth. Paul here is saying that women will be saved through childbearing. God gave pain in childbirth to women. Paul's saying women will be saved through childbearing. What is this all about? Why is childbearing so important? Well, apart from the fact that it creates the next generation. Why is there this focus on it? One theory is that Paul didn't actually mean here that women would be saved by childbearing, but they would be saved through childbearing. Now, that's one theory. But, of course, we know that many women throughout time have died giving birth. So not everybody comes safely through bearing a child. There's another theory, and this theory is that Paul is actually referring here to Mary and saying that it's through Mary giving birth to Jesus that we can be saved. That salvation is going to come through this one birth. But that's not actually what he wrote. So what did he mean? We cannot answer that question. We have to live with it. But what we do know, that although this verse about women being saved through childbirth challenges us, elsewhere in Scripture, Paul is absolutely certain that salvation only comes through Jesus. Again, going to Romans. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Whether you are a man or a woman, it's not through childbirth. It is through the confession of Christ that you make, whether you're a man or a woman. And Paul repeats that message through his teaching. He does not repeat this phrase that women are saved through childbearing. It's there in scripture. We cannot ignore it, but we maybe have to park it. And I hope that doesn't feel like a cop-out. So that's one of the challenges that I had when I read this passage. And of course, the other one is and that women, um, women should learn in quietness and full submission. Okay. Women should learn, said Paul, in quietness and full submission. Paul is saying that women should learn. And that is revolutionary. Because in the temple and in the synagogues, it was the men and the boys who were taught, not the women. So Paul is saying that within a Christian act of worship, the women should also be learners. So he's actually elevating their position. And I think we need to notice that. That's revolutionary. Women should be allowed to learn about faith in just the same way as men should learn. And the quietness and the full submission, okay, we maybe don't like that. And probably under today's ways of learning, it's not the way to do it. But there is that sense, women, pay attention. Maybe because 
if the women were in other acts of worship, for instance, in the synagogue, and they had the children with them, maybe there was a lot of blethering going on. I don't know. Maybe there was less concentration. It's always a challenge when you have a child with you. Pay attention, learn, Paul was saying. And did Paul see women as less when it came to leading and teaching? He says he's not going to allow them to teach or to assume authority, but do you know, how can you teach unless you've learned first? This is early church. If the women aren't particularly well educated in even Jewish thinking, they're going to have to learn before they can teach. So maybe what Paul is saying here isn't so ridiculous. He's saying, for now, I'm not letting women teach. Because they don't have the background, they don't have the education, they don't have the learning. But look at what happened in the house churches. I did a wee bit of scouting around to find out women who were leaders or co-leaders of house churches. There was Priscilla, who was in Ephesus with her husband. There was Chloe in Corinth. There was Lydia in Thyatira. There was Nympha in Laodicea. And there was Phoebe, who's identified as a deacon. Now, a deacon is someone who has responsibility in the church, who is a leader in the church. So Paul worked with them, despite what's written here. And Paul seems to have respected them all because he mentions them in his letters. So Paul wrote, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And he wrote that to Timothy. And we cannot deny that it's there. And we cannot deny that he wrote to other fellowships, that that was his position. It's there. Is it for all time or just Paul's time? Well, you know my feeling about that <laughs> because I'm here. But I wrestled before I accepted a call to ministry. And part of my wrestling, which actually went back to being called to be an elder, even before that, were these verses that were sticking points until I realized that Paul said he didn't permit it. But look back in Scripture. Now, there aren't many women in leadership in Scripture. But there was a mighty woman called Deborah. Deborah in the time of judges, and judges doesn't mean a, a judge in the court as we would mean today. Judge means someone who is leading God's people. And God raised Deborah to lead his people, to have authority over men and women, to teach them of God's ways. God had used a woman way back in time. I found that very helpful to remember that. So what are we left with here? We're left with a passage in scripture that still makes us uncomfortable. We maybe wish it wasn't in scripture, but it is. And that's the thing with scripture. Some parts are easy to read. Some parts encourage us and inspire us. And some make us think deeply or should make us think deeply. What are you going to take from the teaching of a woman this morning? How we come to worship matters. 
that it's not about us. It's all about God. And are you going to take with you that powerful reminder that we are saved through Christ? There is this tricky verse, but the whole of Scripture points to Jesus and faith in Christ gains us salvation. And I'm just going to leave you with another wee question. Right at the end of this passage, Paul wrote about women continuing in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Is that just for women? Or is that for men too? Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks that scripture does challenge us. That there are many passages that we wrestle with, words and phrases that make us uncomfortable. Help us not to shy away from them, but help us to read them in the light of other scriptures as we've done this morning, to discern a deeper truth. Loving God, we know that often there is tension between what we read and the culture in which we live. Help us to discern your ways. Help us to know your truth. We give you thanks that we are all learners in faith. None of us know or understand it all. Help us to be willing to ask questions. Help us to be willing to share when we don't understand, where we have doubts and uncertainties. We might find answers. And in the time when there isn't a clear answer, Help us to live with the question, remaining faithful to you. Help us to learn how we can debate, even when we don't agree. To love rather than to fall out. May Jesus bind your church together. We pray for our broken society, our society that has wandered far from your ways. We pray for those who are in fractured relationships. We pray for those who are caught up in addictions of many kinds and all the damage that that causes. We pray for those who have got very skewed hopes and dreams, totally unrealistic expectations. We pray for those who, through no fault of their own, have been treated unjustly. We pray for our world that is such a contrast of greed and need. Lord God, help us to see your path through the mess that we live in. And help us to stand up for what is right and true. We uphold the National Health Service. We uphold social work departments. We uphold social care workers. And our educational establishments knowing that all are stretched thin just now. We pray for all we know who work in these bodies. In the quietness, we name them before you, asking your strength for them. We pray for charities that 
are trying to plug gaps to meet needs in society today. Help us where we can to offer support, be that financial or in person. And thank you for those who have a heart of compassion. Lord God, if we are lacking compassion in any area of our lives just now, soften our hearts, we pray. We pray for the parts of our society where aggression and violence are the standard reactions. And Lord, we know that to be true in areas of our city. Where families fall out and assaults take place. Where neighbours fall out and people are attacked on the street. Where aggression and violence are seen as a solution where they're really part of the problem. So we pray against aggression and violence in our society and pray that you would raise up peacemakers and those who encourage others to live peacefully. Again, we pray for the conflict between Ukraine and Russia and we pray for an end to hostilities. And we pray for those grieving on both sides of the conflict. Lord God, would you bind up broken hearts. We pray for the closed nation of North Korea. And Father, we pray that if COVID really has taken a hold there, as, as we're told it has, we pray for that nation. We pray for the people. You love them. And they have nothing to fight against this infection. We pray for leadership in North Korea and for the way to be made available, for help to be given. And we pray again for Afghanistan. And we pray for the fear that the Taliban rule there is, is raising up. Lord God, our world is in a mess. give thanks that you are God and nothing is hidden from you. Enable your people to work for change, to speak up for justice and to love as we can your prayerful people bring you our prayers. Amen. Only a holy God let stand and praise.
God, may we know your blessing. May we know your strength to live in faith, love, and holiness. Thank you for preparing us for this coming week. Help us to step out of this building. Prepare to speak for Jesus. To stand for his truth. To love in his name. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen.